Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rowena Hume. I'm the General Manager for Communications and Engagement at Beef and Lamb New Zealand. And I'm just going to um, run through an introduction to this afternoon's webinar before handing over to our panel speakers. So um, yeah, today's webinar is an update on environmental policy with a particular focus on essential fresh water and climate change. We've got two guest speakers this afternoon, um, Sam McIver, our CEO, and uh, Karina Jordan, who is our uh, strategy manager for environment policy. So, I'll explain in a moment just how you can ask questions. Then we're going to go through climate change and there'll be a chance to ask questions uh, there as well. And then at the end of the session, for those that want to stay on, given that we've got our CEO on the line, we thought that we would do an open mic session at the end for farmers to ask any questions uh, that they want. Now, in terms of asking questions, there is a, a chat column down the side of the screen. Um, simply type in there what question you, you have. Um, there's instructions in the link to the meeting invite about how to do that. But if you click in your questions there, um, they'll show up on the screen for me and then I will um, run through those questions through the sessions um, that we have for that. And if there's questions that are the same or similar themes, I may not ask the exact question. I might compile that with um, other ones that are on a similar similar topic. Um, but there should be advice there on how to how to do that there. And if you're having any um, connectivity issues, please, um, we're going to be recording this and, and releasing it out to farmers later. So if you have any connectivity issues today, which we hope you don't, uh, you'll be able to watch this again at another time. So now I'm just going to hand you over to Sam McIver. You're there, Sam. I'm um, on mute, eh? Can you unmute me? Can you unmute me from your end? I'm on. I'm just, you can hear me okay? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I thought I was still muted from uh, my end. Uh, listen, uh, good to see you there. Good to see a lot of uh, familiar faces online, and we look forward to your input uh, later on this afternoon. My job is simply to introduce uh, this afternoon's session. So water and climate change are two significant priorities for farmers, and therefore they're priorities for beef and lamb New Zealand as well. What we want to spend the time doing this afternoon is really four things. Firstly, to tell you what we've been doing. Uh, secondly, where things are at in the freshwater and climate change uh, policy processes. Thirdly, we want to tell you what the next steps are in those processes and what we'll be doing. And then lastly, how you can be involved. And I want to say both as farmers and as advocates on behalf of farmers, what you do uh, makes a real difference. Uh, we talked to 5,000 farmers face-to-face -face last year uh, as we went through biodiversity and, and water uh, consultation along with climate change as well. And the result of that was that you talked to your local MPs, you talked to those that you could influence, uh, local mayors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you submitted, I think we had 3,000 submissions out of the sheep and beef uh, sector. And, and I want to say to you, I want to really encourage you that uh, when you get involved, it does make a difference. Uh, your voice actually counts. And as Karina runs through some of the details today, um, I think you'll be able to see that what you've put forward has actually had um, an influence. You know, we have made some progress in the fresh water uh, consultation. There is still more work to do, and Karina will outline that to you. And, and certainly today, what we want to get from you is you know, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? And, and, and still, what are the remaining issues that you see and the things that you want clarification on? Now, I just want to emphasize, we won't have an answer for every one of those uh, today, but 
I think the fact that you asked the question allows us to know just what we need to continue um, to work on. If we move on from uh, fresh water to climate change, you know, that is emerging as a very significant issue for the sheep and beef uh, sector. And I think off the back of that, what we're seeing from uh, farmers is real concern around afforestation off the back, I guess, of market manipulation uh, that is making uh, planting forestry on farmers is simply as a carbon offset, a very attractive option uh, for people. And so what we've heard from farmers so far and, and rural communities is that you're really concerned about the impact of that on your rural communities. So again, what we want to do is we want to give you an update on where things are at, what we're doing about it, how you can play your part. And, and certainly we want to hear from you, um, your ideas as well, um, because this is, this is going to be a continuous campaign from Beef and Land New Zealand on, on your part. And, and we're really keen to know what you think we could do better. And, and secondly, um, how you'd like to be involved in it as well. So listen, look forward to your questions uh, later and, and providing answers to those. Um, but thanks for coming on. And I'd like to hand over to Karina Jordan now, our uh, Environment Policy Manager, to take the seminar forward from here. Biodiversity, soils, climate, and freshwater. As Ro and Sam said, today's webinar is focused on essential freshwater with a short update at the end on climate policy. But first, I suppose I wanted to take you through some of the work that Beef and Lamb as an organisation has been undertaking over the last couple of years. You know that we've run numerous roadshows across the country on essential freshwater and biodiversity. Um, and over around about 5,000 farmers have turned up to those roadshows. And through those, they've taken up the opportunity to pick up the pen and have their voices heard as the government develops policy that will impact on not only this generation of farmers, but future generation of farmers as well. We've seen an outstanding turnout from farmers and engagement in submission processes. I think overall 4,000 submissions received from the farming community which is the highest level engagement to date. Next slide, thanks. We've also been doing significant research in relation to the impacts of policy and informing where policy should be going. That research has been focused primarily around climate change and the impacts that climate change policy will have on rural communities. It's also been about fresh water and the impacts that will have on farms as well. We've been producing fact sheets, uh, we've been connecting face to face, we've been listening to what we're hearing farmers uh, tell us around their concerns and what the solutions look like to them, and we've been helping you engage in the submission processes. We've been engaging not only at the national level on policy, but for those farmers of you that are also watching what's happening at the regional level, it's also been extremely busy and we've been supporting um, and working with our farmer leaders in those regions to also empower your voices, which are making a huge impact. Next slide, thanks. So briefly to reiterate on central freshwater, the government's released its decisions uh, just in the last couple of weeks. Those have been high level decisions. And what I mean by that is they haven't actually released the changes to the national policy statement, nor the national environmental standard. So what I'm going to run through with you today is Beef and Lamb's analysis of those higher level decisions. We'll obviously need to come back to you on the level of detail because what we know and what you all know as well is that the, the devil is actually in the detail and it's not till you see the regulations and the standards that you can really determine what the impact is going to be and what the ramifications are in relation to those rules. Consultation on the environment the on the essential freshwater package closed uh, last year in October. Over 17,000 submissions were received um, and the highest level engagement by farmers was seen through that process. And importantly, it wasn't just farmers presenting their own unique story and their own worldview and, um, and solutions. Um, and that really resonated with the ministries and also with the government and the ministers. Next slide. 
So a quick recap, the key issues for farmers around the essential fresh water was the grandparenting of land use. What I mean by that is essentially restricting future changes based on a historic land use or farming system. And these were coming through two main rules. One was the freshwater module to the farm plan, and the second was restrictions on land use change. Farmers were also concerned around the intensive grazing rules, and in particular, winter forage cropping and the restrictions on hill country farmers. Managing nitrogen losses in at-risk catchments, fencing of streams and riparian setback distances, and new freshwater bottom lines coming through the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. Next slide. So what farmers sought in a snapshot, essentially a rejection of grandparenting or holding land uses and land use systems to historic levels or practices. And instead they sought flexibility to enable them to adapt to changing markets, changes in climate and changing, changing personal or family preferences as well. They wanted the freshwater module to the farm plan deleted um, and they wanted the rules around feedlots, feed pads, stock holding areas and winter grazing on forage crops amended and they wanted an approach which treated everyone the same rather than uh, penalising some farmers um, against other farmers and in particular I'm talking about the hill country restrictions for winter forage cropping there. They also wanted flexibility around um, nitrogen management for those at-risk catchments and they also wanted to ensure that freshwater outcomes in the national policy statement represented the best available science. They were based on ecological health and that the impacts of opposing uh, different freshwater outcomes were well understood before they saw the light of regulation. Next slide. So what you got, and this is the stuff I think we're all interested in. The freshwater module to the farm plan has been deleted for now. What they've said, and I'll provide a little bit more detail behind some of this, um, and I'll, I'll talk about the farm plan in the next slide, so I'll elaborate on that there. Um, so essentially the freshwater module to the farm plan has been um, deleted for now, so that's the prescription removed. Restrictions on land use change, the bite of them has been narrowed uh, to specifically focus on dairy, dairy support, um, irrigation and dairy, um, and conversion from forestry. Feedlots and feed pads essentially uh, maintain about the same level, though the definitions have been tightened up off the back of farmers' submissions. Uh, winter grazing of animals or forage crops is largely unchanged and possibly a little bit more stringent than what we even originally saw. Nitrogen management has moved from an approach based on overseer to one based on capping the amount of nitrogen fertiliser that can be applied. And there's also been significant changes proposed to the National Policy Statement on Fresh Water, though as I said, we haven't seen those changes and so the analysis will have to wait until we see that in front of us and it's likely to be closer to the end of July. But what we do know is that there will be new environmental bottom lines for some water quality outcomes such as nitrogen and sediment. Next slide. So in relation to farm planning, what the government has said is that they will require mandatory freshwater module to a farm plan in the next few years. However, they've parked the version that they had in the discussion document. And what they've said is they'll work with stakeholders, including industry, to design that freshwater module to the farm plan. And they're going to roll it out in at-risk catchments first. So watch this space. Next slide. So the decisions on land use change, uh, they were capturing a whole lot of land uses, including arable and water culture, as well as dairy, dairy support. And so it did have an impact also on uh, sheep and beef farmers. What they've done is they've narrowed the bite of these rules. So now they're just requiring resource consent if you want to change your land use more than 10 hectares um, from forestry into pasture or into dairy or dairy support or irrigation under the, uh, across a dairy platform. Uh, these rules are interim until regional councils give effect to the national policy statement for fresh water. They indicated that they would only last for five years, but they could be longer depending on how long regional councils take to implement the national policy statement. Consents can be granted for land use change, 
but applicants will need to show that they're not increasing their losses of nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment, or pathogens in comparison to that historic land use. So still an element of grandparenting coming through the land use change rules. Next slide. Stock exclusion. Well, open highlights, I think, is the intention to not require fencing of extensive farming systems in the hill country, which was very much off the back of the submissions that the ministries and the government saw from farmers. Stock exclusion is to be primarily focused on more intensive land uses and from waterways that are one metre or wider. The riparian setback as proposed was five metres and that's also been made less stringent and it's now a three metre setback. There will be the requirement to exclude animals by fencing in the hill country for activities that are more intensive. We yet to see the definition of intensive, um, but also from wetlands that are identified already in district or regional plans. Next slide. At-risk activities are focused around feedlots, feed pads, uh, winter grazing on forage crops. So they've narrowed some of the definitions and they've dropped some of the reach of those rules. There are standards, so if a farmer can't meet the specific standards related to a feedlot activity or a feed pad, then they'll have to apply for a resource consent and as part of that they'll need a farm plan. Also with these high risk activities, we're seeing a new approach to managing nitrogen, which is based on an input control. The input control is a restriction or cap on the amount of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer that can be applied at 190 uh, kgs per hectare per year. And there's a requirement for dairy farmers to provide information about their fertilizer use. Next slide, thank you. There's been limited changes, if any, to the winter grazing on forage crops. There's a permitted activity platform for winter grazing of forage crops on land that's considered low slope or under 10 degrees slope. The standards that need to meet, be met for the activity to be uh, permitted is no more than 50 hectares or more than 10% of the property being cropped, set back distances of five metres from a waterway, a new pugging standard has come through, and that's no greater than 20 centimetre, 20 centimetre pug depth for more than 50% of the paddock, which might be a little bit difficult to implement on the ground, I would say. And there's also a requirement that if you've got bare ground after the grazing of that crop, then it needs to be put back under pasture within a specific time frame. Concerningly, hill country cropping is still required to get a resource consent irrespective of impact and that consent requirement still holds them to a historic extent of cropping. Next slide, thank you. So the, I'm coming to the changes to the national policy statement and what we wanted to do, I'm whipping through this a little bit quick, but I think it's important because it enables time for us as a panel to answer your questions. Um, so I'm giving a high level sort of overview as we flip through. Decisions on the national policy statement. The government has said that they are going to write significant changes to the NPS FM. They're increasing uh, values in relation to cultural values and ecosystem health values for fresh water. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that lands in actual policy speak in the document. We've also got new environmental bottom lines. And these are around nitrogen and phosphorus and E. coli in relation to areas where there's a primary contact recreational swimming opportunity. As proposed, they also wanted to put in a phosphorus bottom line, but that's been amended. Next slide, please. I know that you, in particular, hill country farmers or areas where there's a, a, an issue in relation to sediment will be really uh, minded around the sediment water quality outcomes that will be coming through the national policy statement. So these in-stream sediment outcomes are related to Deposited sediment, that's the stuff that sits on the gravels at the bottom of the waterway, and also uh, visual clarity. It's expressed in a different way, but it's the ability to see through the water um, or, or for fish to see through the water. So um, suspended sediment, essentially. We'll wait to have to wait to see where those bottom lines land to be able to undertake an assessment 
of the implications of uh, sheep and beef farmers in particular of those new environmental bottom lines. But in relation to all bottom lines, what that means is that regional councils will have to undertake an assessment in their region about where their water bodies meet or exceed those environmental bottom lines. And they'll have to put in place uh, management frameworks, which include rules to help either maintain water quality, or if they think it breaches the bottom lines, they'll have to improve it. Or if water quality doesn't provide for values, such as mahinga kai, cultural values, or ecological health values, then also they'll have to set frameworks which improve water quality over time. Next slide, please. The other water quality outcome that farmers were really concerned about was nitrogen. So as proposed, uh, the government was considering a new ecological health bottom line for nitrogen, which was around about 0.8 or 1 milligrams per litre. They've parked that at the moment, but that doesn't mean that this conversation has gone away. What they've said is that they will revisit this after the election and they're waiting on a little bit more scientific advice around where those ecological health outcomes should sit for nitrogen. At this stage, what they've done then is increase the stringency of the nitrogen toxicity bottom line. It was 6.9 and they've moved that up to 2.5. That will mean that regional councils that have higher nitrogen levels will need to review the regional plans and may need to amend them to work towards achieving that 2.5 bottom line rather than the 6.9. It's likely to have an impact on discrete areas in New Zealand because most of our waterways are already below the 2.5, but impact areas will be where we've got more intensive land uses and where we've got um, a harder environment to manage. So gravel or freely drained soils, for example, may be higher rainfall. Uh, areas like Canterbury Springs to mind, uh, some parts of Southland and Otago, parts of the Waikato, parts of Taranaki, and maybe parts of the Manawatu, and there might be hotspots in other parts of the country, um, such as Northland. In relation to phosphorus, I briefly touched on that on the overview slide. Um, I know a lot of you will be interested in this. The government recognised that in relation to phosphorus, uh, there were large areas of New Zealand that naturally have higher background phosphorus levels, and that's a reflection of our volcanic soils. And so what they've said is that they're not going to impose a specific environmental bottom line that regional councils have to meet, but they're going to leave it up to regional councils to specify what they think is appropriate for their catchment or their region in relation to phosphorus and how it should be managed and where environmental outcomes should be set. Next slide, thank you. So this is where you can go for further information if you need it. Uh, and I think we're probably going to open the floor now to a bit of a panel discussion. Next slide, thanks. Hi there. So that's um, the end of the presentation on um, essential fresh water. And just, uh, we're now going to uh, go through some of the questions that have been coming in. Just before we do that, um, just in terms of next steps for this process, I just thought I'd touch on that. Currently writing the regulations following the announcement of the policy side of things. And we'll be um, engaging in that process. And what we'll be focusing on is there was some good, there was are some good things that have been announced in that policy announcement. And so our focus will be on ensuring that that the policy intent, the way that that's written down is reflective. Uh, is reflected in the regulations um, and consistent. And there are also areas, like Karina said, where there's um, lack of clarity around um, what those announcements were, such as intensification and when you need to fence on hill country. So there's a number of areas that we'll be looking to clarify. So what we're keen to hear from farmers in this question phase is what are some of the areas at a high level that they're kind of you're happy with to get a sense of a sense of where farmers are at, but also where are the areas where you're looking for more clarification, some of the, which we may be able to tentatively answer today, but a lot of it will probably just need to kind of take on board the feedback that you're giving us. And those are the things that we'll be, or Karina in particular, um, will be following up on over the next few weeks. Um, in terms of next steps, we understand that the government is intending to announce these regulations sometime in July. And then after that, we will be looking to um, do a 
um, webinar like this with farmers to because then we'll really be able to say this is exactly what's in the regulations and we'll really be able to understand what that means for farmers. So now we'll get into the questions, but just before that as well, I just wanted to acknowledge that we understand that we have been having a few audio issues um, during that presentation and we're working on um, fixing those. Hopefully people have still been able to hear okay, it's just been a bit patchy sometimes. So we got a few questions um, before the uh, session started, so I'm just going to start with a couple of those and um, then run through some of the questions that have been coming in. Please feel free to keep asking while we're while we're doing this. So um, just going to be reading off a screen to my left here. Um, first one we've got uh, in the policy statement, it says that paddocks that have been used for winter grazing must be re-sown no later than a month after the stock have been cropped. We know that this isn't possible. It's pretty impractical in Southland. Is there any work being done to get this change to a more workable solution? We have cows that will finish crop by the end of July and those paddocks won't be in grass or crop till late October, November because the ground needs time to dry out and be warm before planting again. So any feedback on this would be helpful. Karina? Yep. Um, we know that there are farmer concerns around where essential fresh water have landed. We're continuing to advocate, so putting that information in front of officials and in front of the government. But my understanding is that uh, we have limited ability now to change where those rules have landed in relation to what, where the Cabinet papers, um, what they've said, and that's been released through those high-level documents. So this is not a process now where we can actually ask for more change, well, we can ask for more changes but the process is essentially closed and we're unlikely to get more changes in at this stage, though we're continuing to try. So the submissions have closed, the decisions have been made, our ability to influence where it's landed is now extremely limited. Uh, any further work in the space will probably uh, have to be run as an election campaign or uh, with direct connection with um, politicians going into the next election. Um, and we'll have to pick it up uh, when, uh, when the elections are finished and we have a new government as well. So at this stage, all we really can do is ensure that what they released in the decision document is reflected accurately in the rules um, and to talk to them about how they will actually be applied on the ground. And I understand work with regional councils to ensure that they are workable. So in terms of the next question, um, another question. If you have a creek on a property that flows for up to six months of the year, does it need to be fenced off or can you restrict grazing to sheep during that period? It's a really good question. I think it's something that I probably need to see the detail in the final decision to be able to give you a definitive answer on. My understanding is that, um, that you'd be able to run sheep. Uh, they don't need to be restricted from a waterway via fencing that the restrictions apply to permanently flowing waterways of one metre or wider. So tentatively, I would say that you should be fine if your waterway is intermittently flowing. So, um, so there's a question here about really wanting to understand what the definition of forage crop is under the regulations. If under the intensification rules, they're wanting to know if I can't increase the amount of forage crop I have from historical levels, does this include lucerne, chicory, red clover stands, for example? My understanding is that they shouldn't be included, but again, definitions are something we're going to have to wait to see when we see the final regulation. My understanding, the intention is to not include um, those crops that we, uh, the crops that we use as, as normal pasture renewal processes, so our clovers, our chicories, that sort of thing. It, it is an interesting um, sort of observation I guess if you talk about commercial cabbage growing, uh, that's essentially a brassica. We just grow a different brassica uh, for our winter feed for animals. So I think there are some interesting distinctions there that will certainly be taking up uh, with the government to, to, I guess, bring the sensibility uh, to how they apply these things. Yeah. So we also had a question about the timeline for the rules and regulations going forward. I sort of gave a bit of a sense when we think some of the decisions might be made, but Karina, are you able to talk about when they may come into force once those decisions have been announced? Yes, yeah, so like Rose said, we're expecting final decisions near the end of July, 
And as an organisation, I think we're thinking about running a, a new set of webinars to come back to you about where they've finally landed end of July, beginning of August. What I understand is that the rules will be staged and when they bite depends on the specific rule. For example, stock exclusion from waterways, I think, um, kicks off at 2023, then goes through to 2025. Um, however, if you're winter forage cropping, then you could be under new rules as early as 2021. So just a question about whether um, people will be able to get a copy of the PowerPoint slides at the end. We're just sort of working on that. There will definitely be a video coming out in a few days after this that will have all the slides in it um, in terms of whether we send a copy of all the PowerPoint out to people. It might be a bit tricky because it's a very large uh, document, um, but definitely there'll be a video and you'll be able to see all the slides in there and, re and re watch this um, over again. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to put it on our website as a PDF. Yeah, we can put it on our right? website. Yeah. yeah, along with the video. So um, also a question about how refined can the policy proceed in order to accurately determine and manage real catchment effects in each and every catchment of the country? That's a tricky one, and I think I only got part of the question. You the, read it again, Ro? Yeah. I guess the question is how, how do we know how will this policy really be able to accurately determine and manage real catchment effects in each and every catchment of the country? Great question. What we know of national policy is that it's extremely blunt tool. Uh, it generally doesn't allow a bespoke approach to managing uh, risk at a localised level. What we also know is that the best outcomes uh, across wellbeing, so that's community, uh, cultural and environmental come from taking a tailored approach based on the catchment characteristics um, and the specific environmental characteristics at, at that level. So what the government's done through the National Environmental Standard is just really put in place some higher level backstops. Regional councils have to implement them and they can be more stringent depending on their local circumstances. The national policy statement is really where that regional or catchment specific context fits in because that needs to be applied by regional councils at, through regional plans. And I understand that most regional councils are taking a catchment approach to developing uh, catchment plans rather than the old fashioned way of just developing one regional plan, which essentially I ruled them all. So the, the short answer is that catchment communities and a catchment approach is extremely important. It will come through regional plans. Uh, national scale instruments like the National Environmental Standard are blunt and they don't take into account specifically those catchment characteristics. Can, can I just add to that though, at a central government level and a regional government uh, level there, there is a strong recognition of the role that catchment communities or catchment groups uh, can play in actually achieving change on the ground. And uh, both at a regional level and central level, there is a lot of financial support as well as, I guess, spoken support for those initiatives. So so I think, you know, from my perspective, there is the opportunity for, for farmers to take charge of their own situations and their own communities with their own uh, regional councils to, to drive the change in a practical way. Uh, can I add to that, Sam? Because that's 100% correct. And what I'm generally, um, what we're generally out there talking to farmers about is if you do stuff for yourself um, and, you, and you're, you know, working in a way that meets your farm and, and is specific to those opportunities that the environment provides you in your catchment, then you're less likely to be hit by more rules through your regional plan. So while we might not be able to do much about the National Environmental Standard right now, we can get in front of regulation and own our own journey at that regional level by being proactive in this space. So we're getting close to the end of question time, but we could potentially come back to some of these ones right at the end of this um, thing. But we've got a few questions around um, stock numbers and, and feed pads. So, uh, I, so maybe if we could just keep the answers quite short and try and see if we how many we can get through. So are yards classified as holding areas? No. Cool. That's a nice quick one. Are self-feed silage pits buns still being considered as feedlots? 
The feedlot definition is consistent with international definitions for feedlot. Um, I'm sorry, I can't recall that straight off the top of my head. It's the def um, definition we'll have to go back and have a look at. But that shouldn't be captured. My understanding is that we maybe have five feedlots in New Zealand that may meet that definition. Uh, you might be captured under feed pad. Yeah, and there's different rules for that, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. So, um, has anything? There's questions here about: Is there any still? Are there any rules in there still about limiting the number of animals or stock units per hectare? No, I don't think so. Um, and I guess we've kind of answered this, but a question about what is classed as intensive farming on a hill country farm? I don't know. It's the question we've really got. Maybe something to... along the lines of animal grazed on a fodder crop, um, animals grazed on irrigated pasture, something along those lines, but we have not seen the, def the final definition yet. There is there is no stock unit detail in there, is there, Karina? I don't, I don't think so. No, no. Um, so there's a question here. Will a farm environment plan, which includes adequate mitigation for impacts on winter grazing for forage crops on land over 10 degrees slope, replace the required consent? Good question. You could consider a farm plan to be a consent. They can be the same thing. The baseline is that through a consent and through a farm plan, you identify your environmental risks and then you say what you're going to do about it and you have some actions and you have some timeframes. So that's very, those, those three elements are very consistent across a farm plan or a resource consent. My understanding is that there is the intention to essentially have a farm plan consented framework um, for a number of activities, including hill country cropping. And, and certainly our ambition is to minimise the costs and imposition on farmers as they proactively manage the issues on their farm. So that's absolutely what we'll be advocating for is uh, minimum, minimum paperwork for you as farmers to achieve what you need to achieve. And then a final question um, regarding the farm environment plans. How does Beef and Land plan to ensure farmers are working on their FVPs now that to, to include the right information required? How do you, will you ensure Beef and Land's FVPs are as relevant and up-to-date as possible? Great question. Uh, our farm, our land and environment plan two is pretty, cons is, I'll summarise. A number of regional councils have farm environment plans in place now. Many of them have been built off Beef and Lamb's land and environment plan two. So that's still an extremely robust platform on which to base your farm planning off. We might be, we, I think in the future, we're going to need modules around climate change possibly a module around biodiversity, and maybe an add-on or specifics around freshwater management, which build on the LEP2 platform. Beef and Lamb's currently working on that. It's going to be an iterative build, a phase one and then a phase two. And we're partnering with other stakeholders, including connecting with MPI and MFE, to ensure that whatever we're building creates one platform that meets multiple purposes and enables farmers to do it once do it right, uh, provide business certainty, and reduce costs. Great. Um, so now we'll move on to the climate um, change section. Next slide, please. Climate change policy, uh, let's say, is complicated. So the overarching uh, legislative framework is the Climate Change Response Act. But remember that New Zealand climate change policy or domestic climate change policy is intended to give effect to our international commitments as a country under the Paris Agreement. So ultimately, all our policy climate change drivers are aimed towards achieving our commitments, which is the agreement of no greater than 1.5 degrees warming globally, and without impacting on global food production. So that's the overall driver. As part of the Climate Change Response Act, we have a number of sections within that. 
the overall direction setting part of the Climate Change Response Act sits within the Zero Carbon Act. And those uh, that was reviewed in 2019 and farmers submitted on it. But the heavy lifting, that's the part that says what you'll do, you know, how essentially New Zealand's going to meet its international commitments is through the emissions trading scheme. So that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is the emissions trading reform bill, which uh, we've reviewed where farmers and the organisations, primary industries have submitted on, which went in front of a select committee and where decisions have currently just been released. Next slide. So the key issues for farmers in relation to the emissions trading reform bill. I mean, obviously, as Sam said at the beginning of this presentation, the overarching issue here is policy structures or drivers essentially driving whole scale or large scale land use change. And so the concerns we're hearing from farmers and the concerns that be for them as an organisation very much hold is that climate change policy at this stage looks set to drive large scale afforestation um, into exotic species such as pine trees for carbon farming. And where that's likely to hit first is our extensive farming hill countries which will have ultimately an impact on our rural communities. So we've been engaging um, across, across multiple stakeholders talking about these issues. Um, we've met with numerous ministers and their officials um, and we're supporting communities to stand up and voice their concerns around these issues as well. So the emissions trading reform bill is where essentially uh, the rubber hits the road in relation to this. The current changes that we've seen remove that cap on the carbon price. So the carbon price was $25. The cap's been removed. The carbon price is lifted up to $30. Um, and it's likely to be coming up to $50 in the next few years. So that ceiling on the carbon price through this emissions trading reform bill will incrementally increase. And on the back of that also, um, there's a real issue in relation to the emissions trading reform because it doesn't limit or cap the amount of offsetting that can happen in New Zealand. So it doesn't limit or cap the amount of carbon farming that can occur. And this has significant implications for two main reasons. Firstly, it really talks to the ability of New Zealand to reduce its fossil fuel emissions and actually achieve its climate change targets. And secondly, it's essentially planting pollution onto our farms with an ultimately, ultimately an impact on sheep and beef farms, uh, the red meat sector, agriculture in, in its entirety, and also our rural communities. Next slide, please. So what has Beef and Lamb been doing in this space? I sort of alluded to it. We've been connecting with multiple ministers, both those um, that are in government and in opposition, opposition government as well, and the main reason is to see if we can influence where policy lands in relation to this, but also so that we can provide some thought leadership.